Hey everybody, if you have a bachelor's degree and live anywhere in the United States, there's now a way for you to take your bourbon education to the next level. The Distilled Spirits Business Certificate from the University of Louisville is an online program that can be completed in as little as 15 weeks and will prepare you for the business side of the spirits industry. It's offered by the AACSB accredited College of Business. And this certificate was developed in partnership with industry experts to be one of a kind. And it's going to prepare you for your next adventure. Learn more about this online program at uofl.me slash pursue spirits. All right, let me see if I can't get everybody to just like quiet on the set here. All right, quiet on the set. <laughs> Hey everybody, what is going on? It is episode 222 of Bourbon Pursuit. I'm one of your hosts, Kenny, and we've got a ton of news to run through. Let's not wait, let's dive into it. Eagle Rare Bourbon is announcing the 10th annual Eagle Rare Life Award. Now, Eagle Rare has partnered with Garden and Gun to seek nominations for the 10th annual Eagle Rare Life Award. The award celebrates those who lead a rare life, as defined by showing courage, leadership, survival, devotion, character, and heroism. Past recipients have included Brian Anderson representing USA Cares and Jake Clark of Save a Warrior. To nominate a remarkable individual for the annual Eagle Wear Life Award, submit an application by November 3rd, 2019. The finalists and their stories will be featured on gardenandgun.com from November 15th to December 6th, and it allows you to go and cast your votes. The winner of this award will be announced in early 2020. We talk all the time about how big players in the industry are always expanding, but now we get to see one sort of on the the mid-size. Wilderness Trail. Now, you've heard from Pat Heist and Shane Baker back on episodes 121 and 130. They are planning to add three new additional buildings to their site, including a 13,000 square foot addition. This is going to be an expansion of their bottling and administration buildings, plus two new rickhouses, each totaling around 16,624 square feet. They will store 20,520 barrels each, and they will be next in line for construction. The distillery's bottling operation is undergoing a $1.5 million expansion right now with a new automated bottling line and warehouse space, as they are going to be adding also more headcount in operations and administration. The distillery is currently wrapping up around a $6 million in capital projects for 2019 and has $8 million in projects underway for 2020 but now they are doing close to 215 barrels of whiskey per day. You can read more about this in our show notes with the link to amnews.com. Back on episode 152, we featured Guthrie McKay of Toddy's Liquors. Now, this topic is polarizing to some folks. Today, Guthrie charges more than secondary prices for his allocated bourbon. And with this small shop that has a lot of listeners and shoppers going through, it puts them in angst and almost kind of gets you frustrated and mad. But Guthrie has seen the highs and lows, and he was a kind of a key and secret ingredient to helping the whiskey boom. And you can hear some of those stories that we recounted back on that episode 152. But, you know, Guthrie was also this week featured in a liquor.com article titled The Best Bourbon Store on Earth. Uh, That might be a little bit of clickbait, but we provided a few quotes to give context to the story, and you can read that article with the link in our show notes as well. Jim Beam's Knob Creek is announcing a new, limited edition bottling called Quarter Oak. The new release finishes Knob Creek bourbon in Quarter Oak casks for four years. Now, Quarter casks are, as the name suggests, one quarter the size of traditional 53-gallon barrels. And as we've seen this before, this means that there's an increase in the surface area with the charred oak relative to the volume of whiskey inside. You can call it accelerated aging, but it could just mean uh, different types of taste profiles that are coming out of it. But when this finished product is going to be dumped from the quarter cask, it is then blended with Knob Creek and bottled at 100 proof to create the Knob Creek quarter oak. This is going to have a suggested retail price of $50. And with more release news, Heaven Hill is announcing that they are doing their first line extension of Larceny Kentucky Straight Bourbon Whiskey, Larceny Barrel Proof. Released on an allocated basis three times per year, the first release of this weeded bourbon will ship in January of 2020. 
Larceny Barrel Proof offers whiskey fans the opportunity to taste Larceny just as Heaven Hill's Master Distiller does Connor straight from the barrel. Each release will have varying proofs and consist of barrels aged of six to eight years old with releases in January, May, and September. And this is also gonna have the same naming convention that we've seen with Elijah Craig Barrel Proof. So the first release will be A120. A representing the first batch of the year, one representing the month, which is January, and 20 representing the year 2020. Each release will be bottled at barrel proof, non-chill filtered, and available at a suggested retail price of $49.99. We first saw it with Blacken, which is Metallica's new whiskey, followed by a collaboration of Slipknot with an Iowa whiskey company, and now Few Spirits and Warner Music Artist Services are announcing a new release called All Secrets Known, which is a new limited edition bourbon distilled by Few Spirits master distiller Paul Heltko in collaboration with Grammy-nominated and multi-platinum selling Seattle grunge pioneers Alice in Chains. Now, whose music has also stood the test of time and flew its a generation, as well as a lot of whiskey lovers out there too. Bottles will feature a custom design label by artist Justin Helton. For this release, Few Bourbon is finished for six months in tequila barrels, bottled at 101 proof, and will have an SRP, or a suggested retail price of $75. Seeing this is how uh, Bourbon Pursuit, we hardly ever really talk about scotch, but the Glenlivet has the internet up in arms because they have released something that was new, it was a video, and the internet has coined it Scotch Pods. They are clear seaweed wraps that are completely edible and have a cocktail in a clear capsule. Glenlivet partnered with a sustainable startup on this new idea, and it has everyone talking about it. Some folks thought it was April Fool's in October, but we'll see who has the last laugh on this one if they catch on. They will be served during London's celebration of cocktail innovation through October 13th, and you can read about that with more in our show notes. We've talked about tariffs on the podcast before, and tariffs, the retaliation, they're coming back harder and harder. The U.S. is now going to be imposing a 25% tariff on scotch whiskey being imported into the U.S. This is going to increase the price of scotch for Americans. The U.S. is the largest market with over $1 billion of scotch whiskey being exported in 2018. Well, perhaps this might get more people drinking bourbon in the end, but who knows what the outfall of this could be. You can read more about it with the link in our show notes as well. Now, speaking of what things that we have going on, our community took one for the team and selected a barrel at Traverse City, which ended up being a seven-year MGP. We're incredibly fortunate that we get to bring these experiences to our Patreon community and happy that all these whiskey geeks get to be a part of them. We have a new barrel pick to announce, which is in addition to our last week that we announced, which is our Eagle Rare barrel, we're also adding in to 2019 a Jack Daniels barrel proof that will be taking place in December. This is going to bring our 2019 tally to 19 barrels selected. And we've already got our first barrel lined up for 2020 as well. Thanks once again to our retail partner, Keg and Bottle out of the San Diego area for making this all happen. You can go check out their website and get whiskey shipped straight to your door at keg, the letter N, bottle.com. Today's podcast, it's one for the diehards. You know who you are because you join in the conversation when distilleries are increasing their prices or you get angry because your barrel picking group got snubbed because of allocation reasons. Now, the trio of Bourbon Pursuit, we're here to talk about some of the actions that we've seen over the past year and contemplate, do bourbon companies actually care about their consumers? Or is this just a part of a bigger game that we all have to play? We mentioned it towards the end of the show, but if you're a producer and you're listening to us, just know that we love you and we do our best to play devil's advocate. But there's some things that we saw that we really feel like we should take the bourbon community's view and kind of really talk about it, put it out there in the open and see what happens. So hope you're going to enjoy this one. All right, so let's get down to it. Here's Joe from Barrel Bourbon, and then you've got Fred Minnick with Above the Char. It's Joe from Barrel Bourbon. We enjoy finding and identifying barrels that contain distinctive traits and characteristics. We then bottle them at cast strength to retain their authentic qualities for the whiskey enthusiast. Keep up to date with our newsletter at BarrelBourbon.com. I'm Fred Minnick, and this is Above the Char. I reached out to my followers on Twitter for this idea, and Bourbon West came up with a good one. He wanted to know how we could improve the etiquette of standing in lines for bourbon. 
And he's speaking in particular of the etiquette towards the distillery, the store owner, the proprietary. He's saying that he sees some disgusting behavior out there when it comes to standing in line for these rare bottles. So thanks, Bourbon West, for this idea. And here's the thing. If we want bourbon so badly that we're willing to camp out overnight, stand in a long line. I mean, I bring my kids to these things, so I have to. It's it's the only way I can get there because my wife will be out of town or she'll be running. And the only way I can go to a lot of these events is if I bring my kids. And so right then and there, I'm kind of like an odd man out. People look at me funny because I've got my kids and I'm standing in line for bourbon. So they're like, hey, there's, there's your dad of the year. But you do see people, like, get very angry toward the store owner if they are the last in line and they don't get a bottle. Or they're at the front and they can't get what they want or they see a bottle in the store and the store owner won't sell it to them. I've seen people yell. I've seen people throw uh, tantrums. And then you see people on social media afterwards just absolutely tearing apart a business for them not selling them a bottle. And is that right? Well, you know, it's free speech and people have the, uh, they can do whatever they want. But when you're inside someone's property and you are there as a customer, there are some things that you should do. First, you should never really raise your voice to the store owner. That could be, you know, considered threatening. And, you know, if somebody wanted to, they could kick you out. And you should be just a good, decent human being. You got to remember, this whole bourbon thing, it's, it's just a hobby. This isn't something. It's not life and death. We're not curing cancer. We're trying to get a nice bottle of bourbon. So treat people with respect. And so there are three rules that I recommend that everyone carry when it goes into these stores. Dress nice. This may sound very weird, but people do not act like assholes when they dress nice. Now, what is nice? Now, you know, I wear an ascot. I'm not saying you have to do that. For God's sake, I'm the only person left on the planet still wearing the damn things. But, you know, maybe like a like a polo shirt and khakis and a pair of nice shoes. And you'll find that y- you don't want to be a dickhead when you're dressed pretty nicely. Number two, say thank you. Even if you do not get the bottle you want, the store manager, the uh, store clerk, anybody you interact with, the distillery, whoever, just say thanks. And number three, the people who you're around with, start talking to them. Where are they from? Some of the best friends I've made in Bourbon have been from standing in line at these places. You really do meet some cool people. They'll be from all over the state or country, and sometimes even out of the country because it's their only opportunity to get a rare bottle. So just practice those three things. It it seems like little, but hopefully it will diffuse someone else from being a dickhead when they're shopping for bourbon. And that's this week's Above the Char. Hey, if you have an idea like Bourbon West did, hit me up on Twitter or Instagram, at Fred Minnick. That's at Fred Minnick. Until next week... Cheers. Welcome back to the episode of Bourbon Pursuit, the official podcast of bourbon. The whole trio here today, um, wow. hoping we don't burn some bridges, right? I mean, we're going to be bringing the heat, putting some people under some fire, um, but also, I think, speaking for the broader bourbon community that's out there, because we're going to be talking, and the subject is, you know, do distilleries actually care about their customers? And this is, we thought about this idea because... Gosh, what was it? Probably six months ago, we had this this concept of like everything. The news was changing. There's people that are taking off products. There's mm-hmm. allocations of barrels that are just getting axed across the board from, yeah. as Fred always said, people that took you to the dance. So today yeah, we're going to... Single barrel programs, not kind of going to who usually mm-hmm. participated in and so that's exactly what today we're really going to be focusing on is, is looking at, and hopefully, you know, I think we're going to take some, put some fire and put some heat under some people. Uh, we're also going to have to play a little devil's advocate, right? Kind of, well, one of us, one of us will kind of take the role of, well, if I'm take the, the distiller, side. if I'm the distiller here, like, what's my response to this? Well, fuck it. Let's just, <laughs> let's just raise <laughs> our mean, Whatever, whatever, whatever. Like, I mean, it, it, this is a, this is a conversation that we need to have. Yeah. Uh, they need to know. We need to have this conversation because they're. You know, I feel like sometimes distilleries live in a bubble. Mm -hmm. They live in a bubble of their bottom line and, you know, help benefiting their shareholders. And the information's out there. It's not like they can't go to 
um, a social media forum and find the data, find, find people conveying their feelings about what consumers want and what they need. You know, 30 years ago, they'd spend $150,000 to get the kind of um, feedback that is free now yeah. on social media. Mm-hmm. And what I have found consistently is that they continue to ignore a lot of what people want or at least what they're saying they want on social media. Absolutely. Well, they got short memories. They forget that like just 10 or 15 years ago, nobody gave a shit about them. That's except right. a few. So before we also kick it off and dive even further, you know, if you're watching on video, you might be hearing some background noise, some people shuffling through because we are recording an episode of this podcast from the Barrel Room at Hotel Distill, which is going to be on Historic Whiskey Row here in Louisville and it's set to open on November 1st. And Hotel Distill is a place that is exciting. It's got a rich history that's happening here. It's now being transformed uh, into this great space. Um, it's designed to really, you know, what they say is ignite your passion for discovery and will be the social anchor for Louisville's revitalization and refinement of bourbon culture. And you can book your experience now and stay at this authentic Louisville destination at hoteldistill.com. Yeah, I think this is JTS Brown's office, they said. At one point? There, yeah, this is the actual building his office. I had no idea. Fred, yeah. you, got, you got any insight into yeah, that? Yeah, this is, this is the... This is one of the, I actually have an old photo of, of like the, um, I have an old photo of like the outside and it said JTS Brown. It was actually out there for yeah, a long time. Yeah, the facade. Yeah. And, you know, a lot of cool things happened in here. It just amazes. Like 10, 15 years ago, all this was like a dump. <laughs> and yeah. Now it's well, like, I mean, it was, it it's was like a, a renaissance. Facade. I mean, it was right. a facade, what Whiskey Row was. I mean, I remember one of our first podcasts we did was actually saving Whiskey Row and what it was and yeah. all the effort that went in for historical and preservation societies of, of what it went to actually save a lot of the buildings and the facades that you do see out here. Guys, so. I want you to think about this. You know, in the 1800s, early 1900s, there were fellows walking around in their suits, going to meetings, and they were brokering deals about uh, bulk whiskey. And they were talking about, like, um, you know, exporting it to Japan or Germany or wherever. I mean, this is where all the action happened for American whiskey. We're, it's like we're the right Wall here. Street. Yeah, it's the, it's the Wall Street of, mm-hmm. of, of whiskey. I, I really don't like using that term, but it, it is. It really is. Um, and it just kind of went away. And, yeah. and, and, and Louisville... Uh, you know, I, and I give a lot of this credit to our mayor, Mayor Fisher, Greg Fisher. I, I really don't think, you know, any of this renaissance happens without, you know, kind of like his, his vision to like improve, improve this part of our culture. Well, and I know, and it might be a slide of Ryan, you know, he always has this famous line that, you know, Bardstown is the, the capital of bourbon, but yeah, Louisville, is. Louisville is the <laughs> epicenter of bourbon. Well, maybe now. No. <laughs> Ten years ago, not so much. Maybe. Nobody cared about down there, down here. <laughs> then so, they saw how cool it was in Bardstown. So they're like, ah, oh, we got to do it. We got to go do it now. Absolutely. Yeah, so hopefully Bardstown can put up some hotels like this. I think they oh, really need gosh, to. They're they missing need, it. They just, need this. Just, put a distill in Barstown, be awesome. There you go. So let's go ahead and let's dive back into the subjects here and, and let's go ahead and we'll take, we'll take a, an easy one, right? I mean, this is one that is, is of recent news because as people, you know, ourselves live in Louisville, we live in Kentucky, we had access to the white label six year Heaven and Hill bottle and bond. And it was a, you know, it, it kind of made, I mean, it was pretty big news, right? I mean, when they said they were going to take it off the market, um, however, there was no announcement to say that there was going to be a relaunch. There's no anything like that. It was just something that I think it usually kind of started through the grapevine where the distributors found out about it. The distributors told the retailers, the retailers then told the consumers. And then from there, everything went kind of berserk and people just started clearing the shelves left and right in Kentucky of actually finding this, uh, this white label. And Fast forward two to three months afterwards, then a press release comes out that says they're going to be relaunching with an additional year and, uh, you know, 3x the actual price of what it was before. Uh, before you could get it around, what, 12, 15 bucks, uh, and then it was coming back with an SRP of $40. Uh, but not only this, it was also going out a little bit further outside of Kentucky, hitting, I think, what, mm-hmm. six, seven, eight states, something like that during uh, it, its first um, launch. So let's kind of talk about that. Um, what do you think Heaven Hill did wrong in this situation? Well, they, we kind of talked about this on the round table, but, um, you know, it, it, 
they think we're like stupid or something. Like they just totally like think us consumers, like we'll put out this press release and just believe what we say. And it, it happened with Elijah Craig 12, you know, for oh, years yeah. we were like, totally forgot to that we're like, Oh, we're going to move the 12 from the front to the back. And you're like, is it going away? No, never, never going away. And then it goes from the back. It's not no longer a, a number. They write the letter 12 or the word 12 on the back. And then after that, and it's like, you think we're stupid? And then they do the same thing with Heaven Hill, like six years. They'd say, oh, it's going away, never coming back. And then, you know, hold and behold, three months later, you get a press release. And so it's like, I get what they're doing. They're going to try to make it a more premium product to the mainstream audience. But like 10 to 15 years ago, nobody cared about you. Well, and that's, I mean, let's, let's also, I'll, I'll take their side a little bit here. Um, you know, not even until that, that was really happening, not a ton of people really cared about the white label. I mean, it was always available. It's always there. It was something that well, it was kind and, of our whiskey geek. Like it was like the thing you knew about, like, you're like, that's the bottle that you go. That's nine ninety nine or ten ninety nine that you could always count on as a great pour at a great value and like you said it was kind of you had to be in the know to know about it uh to answer your question kenny i think the one thing that the mistake they made was transparency Mm -hmm. um and i i'm very very close with with heaven hill i think their whiskey is fantastic um yeah some of the best i mean i they do a great job but I, I think in this growth of American whiskey, there there has been a there still has been a little bit of this kind of like old school protectionism of holding on to their ideas and what they're going to be doing, you know, to kind of protect it from you know their competitors finding out. But really, what has happened is is that consumers, we feel like we have a right to know. Of like what's happening, but what are they hiding? Like it's whiskey. It's not FBI. Right. <laughs> like but, they but, act like they got like mm-hmm. this. Secret. And let me ask you: Would if they said we are pulling Heaven Hill six year old off the market to rebrand it and bring it back as a seven year old bottled and bond at an additional price to more consumers? Would you be? I've been as fine ma- with that. <laughs> See, that's just it. I think most people would be fine with that. And the Eliza Craig thing, I would have been fine with. Hey. We really want this to stay available on shelves. We don't want it to be like Weller 12, so that's why we're going to drop the age statement, kind of do a blend of 8 to 12, which, by the way, the 8 to 12 sometimes I mean, I is was, better. I mean, I but, was, um, to use Preston Van Winkle's term, I was butthurt for probably about two years. about. Um, <laughs> you still uh, don't uh, let it go. Yeah. <laughs> but, but it was about so the like, Elijah Craig 12-year-old. But it was like so tricky, just like, like we're going to put the age statement you know write it on the back and like hide it and then eventually just phase it out and then change the i also so like, so that that's to me is the only thing the business decision to do it i don't have a problem with um and i don't think it's them not caring about their consumers i think it's i think it's simply a i think they make a decision and they try to think about the best way to to release it and they're not thinking about necessarily the the backlash on the whiskey geeks. They we are still very much a very small portion. Oh, of, we're of we're the, the we're the one percenters, right? Yeah. That's that's the one one thing I think. If I keep taking the distillery side of this, and I keep thinking, well, if I'm Heaven Hill, um, I my goal is to look at the broader market, right? My goal is to focus on that. And when I even put out these press releases, who cares except? you know, the, the 10,000 people that are like really hardcore into this. Right. And I I still just flabbergasted about like, they they think they have this secret stuff. Do you think like Buffalo trace gives a shit that they're taking heaven Hill six off year and bringing it and relaunching it? Like, what do they, what do they think they're hiding? Like, I I just mean from a competitive standpoint, right? Like, yeah, I mean this whiskey takes years to develop to what it becomes. And so like when you announce something, you've thought about it for a very long time. Like, Somebody just can't replicate it like a month later, you know. And to- <laughs> let's remember too, fourteen years ago when there was like there were like two or three of us out there uh kind of writing about this sort of thing. Now, I mean, you have a sea of uh social media people, you know, finding a bottle, you know, analyzing every single thing and it's a very knowledgeable base. And so we can, you know, people can find out things really quickly. And also, Heaven Hill's got a, you know, they have a few people in their organization that, you know, will 
will get on social media under under uh, anonymous handles and say things. So there's and they have some moles. They have they have some leakers, mm-hmm. and so does I mean they all do. They all do. So I'll take the other side of this and. Well, we had Larry Cass on the show, right? And, you know, before he retired. And Larry is still being, uh, even in his retirement, he's actually being very outspoken on this, even on social media. Bourbon and, Hall of Famer, by the way. Yes, yes. Recent inductee to it. Yeah. Um, and, you know, he goes against the saying, it's, it's in, like, the brand has been undervalued for far too long. True. And it's, and it's very true. Very true. And I, think, I think bourbon in itself had been undervalued for this far too long. This is very true. Um, I agree with all that. But I guess, you know, when we look at it from another standpoint of, you know, if we're going to... Is there a market to keep bringing $15 bottles of whiskey or, or are we past that? Because it had been that way for so long. Is Do we just need to move on? So I've done some research and the studies show that when you raise prices, you actually get more customers. And I've witnessed many people go into liquor stores at my various, uh, you know, book signings and stuff. And, you know, they're new to bourbon. They don't know anything about it. And the... Um, the store rep will try to get someone to buy Four Roses Yellow Label. And they'll look at the price and they say, no, it's too cheap. I want that one. And they'll point to like Jefferson's Reserve. Mm-hmm. And I'm picking, I'm picking Four Roses Yellow Label every day of the week over Jefferson's Reserve. We still love Trey, by the yeah. way. Still yeah, love, I mean, still yes, Trey. But, but that from a value perspective, you know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. It's like, that's like, it's, you know, I'm saving pennies or I'm saving, you know, 10, 15 bucks. Yeah, absolutely. But the, the everyday consumer looks at this as a luxury good and $15 isn't luxury. And that's, that's kind of where they're, that's where these, these distillers are coming from. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I understand that from like, if you're buying a gift or wanting to try something special, but if you're wanting like quality everyday drinkers, you know, that you got to have an affordable option, like $30 $30, $30 for Heaven Hill Bald and Bond, I think, or whatever, it's going to be $40. I think it's, o- it's I think it's overpriced for what good. it is. It's I mean, good. It's cr- I mean, it's good, but I can drink something else. You almost else said if- great, didn't you? <laughs> he almost said great. He <laughs> kept, he kept he himself him, from saying it's, great. It's caught him slipping. It's above average. <laughs> <laughs> and so, well, well, I mean, it takes it from an everyday drinker to like, am I going to go buy it at 40? Whereas if I would have it, you know, constantly on my bar, but... They don't care about me. They care about the mass audience, and so. All right. So here's the here's the sad, hard truth of it. The only line against this is the bartender. The bartender has to have it at a surf a certain uh, price in order for them to make mm-hmm. money. And you can't when, make a forty dollar cocktail, exactly. right? You got it's got to be ten to fifteen. So that's why that's why like in Scotch, you know, they have like monkey shoulder. And uh, Glenn Livett, twelve year old, you know, those are very affordable, you know, well scotches. And the bartender community will always make sure that we have a fifteen to twenty five dollar bourbon because they have to make money on it. And you know, Larry Rice is not going to be making cocktails with, uh, you know, fifty five dollar bourbon. Absolutely. So I guess that's that. It kind of like makes me think of another question. Like if one of the main strategies behind bullet and how bullet became so big was because they were able to get behind the bar. Yeah. So in, in bullet is not a 15, $20 bottle, right? I mean, last time I checked, it's still in the 35 to $50 category. I don't know. I actually, I've, I've seen it for, I saw it like $18 at Costco. Mm-hmm. Is it? Yeah. Yeah. Well, never mind. Yeah. Bullets in the sub $25 range. So we found for, out what Kenny doesn't buy. <laughs> well, <laughs> I just don't pay that much attention. Apparently. <laughs> So I think we, we beat up on Heaven Hill a little bit. So I think... Uh, well, I mean, well, not beat up on them. It's just... They know the criticism and they, they, they see it. Um, and it's also stuff that I wouldn't tell them to their face. You know, like I... Uh, <laughs> we'll do it on the podcast. You know, and, 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 and like, Behind their uh, back. No and, one's going to hear this. And they always push back of like, we are... Um, we're a business and we're trying to, to make money. What I really... The, the thing about it is I also feel bad... For for Heaven Hill because they get they do get a lot of uh, uh, blowback and poor Bernie Lovers that guy's doing his job yeah but they do it to themselves they like. do it to themselves <laughs> but Bernie's like sometimes just kind of left on an island he's gotta be the like, punching oh, bag yeah. you know you know and it's like I hope they're paying him well and if not they need to give him a raise because that he takes a lot of uh, 
a lot of abuse. I mean, it feels, yeah, you got to have a little bit of empathy for him too, because he ends up being like the spokesperson for the brand. I mean, yeah. Brian, Ryan, do you remember when we interviewed him, we had a two part interview and we actually asked him, we asked him about Elijah Craig and the 12 year age statement. And he looked, I mean, he came and he said, it, and he goes, no, it's not going away. You know, we're just moving to the back and blah, blah, blah. And then like, Two months later, <laughs> it's like, again. whoops, yeah. You know, well, see, we had to do this because we see, had to make it available. And it's like, well, two months later, it was available. What changed in two months? Yeah, it's, <laughs> But remember, too, like, that's the strategy. information he had. Oh, mm-hmm. it's not his fault. It's just, and, that's that's, the, and that's also the information that the, someone gave to him had. Mm-hmm. You know, so, um, you know, the decision was made that I, I, I have no doubt that, you know, they're looking at stocks and they're looking at, uh, where the future is and everything, and I, they make just, they make decisions in a moment, and and then everyone else is 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 forced to like kind of catch up to it. I mm-hmm. guess I just don't understand. I understand. Yes, bourbon's undervalued. I totally agree with that. But that's what your Elijah Craig's, your Henry McKenna's, your Evan Williams single barrels, your William Heaven Hills. That's what they're. Those are brands are for. Heaven Hill has been a everyday affordable drinker. I don't understand. Why pivot, take away from those brands to but, but to they, position this one when it's been like a bomb of the shelf all for all? Its I time. also think so. You're you're thinking of one particular thing. You got to realize when you go to Heaven Heaven Hill, we've all been in the label room. There's hundreds of thousands of labels that they have. Maybe not hundreds, but they're definitely thousands. Yeah, of and labels I'm pretty sure like in, they bought every abandoned trademark yeah. of a. Well, bourbon. I just don't. Under, well, no. The, and, and so let me keep going here because I, you know, when you think about the Heaven Hill bottle and bond, that's one thing. But you still got Evan Williams bottle and bond. You've got Virgin. You've got all these things. But don't get me wrong. I know people are starting to hate on the Virgin thing now because they're dropping the age statement off that one as well. <laughs> so it, you know, it's just a continual progression of of what are they going to be able to Let's do? Let's be honest. That was the best marketing that Virgin ever had. No one knew about that fucking bourbon. Oh, you know, I mean, we, I mean, there's yeah, that's, like we yeah. knew about that it. That sounded weird. But like, I, I was, I was cracking up with like all these people. Like, oh, it's okay. I was like, you didn't know about that bourbon. Mm-hmm. It's, it was a very like, I mean, Heaven Hill bottle of bomb. People knew about it, but it's like out of the woodwork. There were all these Virgin fans. Like, come on. Yeah, and those were what, mostly in like North Carolina. Yeah, Alabama, I mean, well, there were people like in like Washington saying like, I can't get it anymore. It's like, motherfucker, you couldn't get it anyway. Yeah, <laughs> you know, so not even we tried. But it's like, I don't know. Yeah. I, but I mean, I they still, what you're saying. They but. still came out. I mean, they rebranded it and came out of, as Quality House, right? So it's still it's still the same bottle, yeah, same it's, shape. You know, it just doesn't it's, have the um, name. Let, let's, <laughs> I mean, I, I, Heaven Hill's seven-year bald and bond thousand-barrel dump is not a $40 bottle. Like, it's... Well, I get it. It's a rebranding. It's a way to do this. I mean, you can also see this as a way that, you know, they, they wanted to remove the name Heaven Hill from lower in tiers like they're, okay green they're, label's not going away the 90 proof one no, and you I know guess why that's true. because someone in the shapira family that's what they buy oh well see. and so it's on their it's on their bar inside and the so right it'll, it'll it'll always be there because they that's what they drink mm-hmm. uh you know I, I i think it's probably important that we also look at some of the some of the brands that have uh reacted to consumers pushing back on price increases oh, absolutely like when Booker's announced that they were going to be a hundred dollar bottle, you know they went, they they reverted pretty quickly because they were like they were getting murdered. Oh, yeah. absolutely. I, mean, I don't know if you remember that. But oh yeah, um, just a, it just was like only two within years like ago. a month they changed it back. Yeah, they today. changed it back, and um, you know they didn't have to change any branding or anything, but uh, you know they still have a little bit of residual. And I mean uh, to be fair, Booker's that. probably I mean it's a barrel proof six year like really good. Bourbon. I mean, I, I, yeah. when you used to get it for fifty five bucks, yeah, yeah. I mean, it was it was. I a, mean, it's, it was a it's like one of the most incredible values out there. That like, is a that is to me a, that was a more uh, palatable, you know, price increase. Um, you know, they they decided to change. I think it's seventy five or something yeah. like that. It's the SRP now. It's about. That's probably right where it needs to be. And I think people are happy with that. Yeah. People are still happy with that. And I mean, I still recommend it when people haven't tried something and you want to, you know, start elevating and trying to go barrel proof and, um, you know, to kind of just take a note off your above the char from a few yeah. weeks ago, you know, being able to experience the different flavors you can get with yeah. barrel proof by starting at barrel proof, adding some water, adding mm-hmm. some ice, letting the ice melt. You know, you get to yeah. you get to experience bourbon five different ways in a in a barrel proof whiskey like that so yeah. and something you can always find too but you know Booker, bookers isn't the only one remember makers even 
what had it been five years ago, but the yeah, proof, the proof, the proof, yeah, the uh, proof debacle. They exactly. still won't, they still won't talk about it. So for our listeners out there, this is what happened in uh, 2013. Makers Mark decided to lower the proof from 90 proof to 84, and they announced it to their uh, brand ambassadors, which is their program that they have for their it's their customer loyalty program. So they sent an email to it, and people went batshit crazy. It was uh, it was. It ended up being a front page news. Uh, Jay Leno or one of the you know the talk shows were talking about it. It was on uh, CNN. It was everywhere, and I got like this. Um, I was I was covering it very very intensely, and I got these interviews with Bill Samuels and Rob Samuels, and um, <laughs> I remember Bill saying like. Well, son of a bitch! I guess people really care about our whiskey, you know. And it's <laughs> we just never like, knew it. It's a good and problem. It's, to have. And it's like they, the state, Bill always has this way of like making everything sound funny and putting things in perspective. But they changed it back. But to this day, people think people think it's a uh, it was a marketing ploy because they, it was only eight days that they had it out there. But think about it they had to change their labels you know they mm-hmm. had to pull uh, well they had they already had product out there they, had, they had product out there i mean and that's kind of i think uh i wouldn't say it's a unicorn by any means but it's definitely a unique bottle that people could own. how many 84 proof uh makers marks do you have i don't even think i've ever had it or tried it not at that have proof. you had it the 84 no proof? i never I, I, i've had it I, they actually i tasted it on air for a tv station i was like yeah this is uh it's more watered down. <laughs> it was like <laughs> very light. There you go. I mean, really, it's Maker's is not, um, I mean, it's nice, but it's not the most complex whiskey. You know, it's it's fine for what it is. But uh, I really did think it was a bad move from a whiskey perspective because you could taste the difference. You really could. Yeah, but I think they've they've been able to rebound and with, oh, you know, yeah. flying colors. So I haven't really had a problem with like them these, since These then. companies need, like, somebody on their team. Like, they have, like, bean counters, like, Making these decisions, you know, like let's, I mean, let's not like in the, like, in the in the government. They, they just have don't have a, a pulse. Like the government has like someone from like so the VA has like veterans on committees to like a, like a veteran oversight committee to mm-hmm. make sure that the veterans are getting treated like they should be instead of like the you know the doctors want maybe want to treat them. And I think you're right. I think that might not be a bad idea. But you know what? They're never going to go for it. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> and you know, and here's an example I can think of. Like Sazerac, in in a lot of people's eyes, they're they're public enemy number one, and and that's that's because their stuff is highly allocated, hard to get, but it's so damn good. Yeah. It's so I mean, that's same with Heaven Hill. Their whiskey's so damn good. It's kind of like, you know, it, it's kind of like the it's a love hate relationship. It, exactly. <laughs> it's like the the girlfriend you had in high school who you couldn't stand, but she was so hot, pretty. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you, you, you keep chasing after. You're, like, you're, like, you're like, all right, <laughs> can't help myself. Fine. She keeps treating me like crap, but <laughs> yeah. I can't stop. So I guess, you know, let's, we'll kind of shift the gears a little. Let's talk about Sazerac. As the saying goes, Portland is weird. Perhaps it's something in the water. It turns out that there might be some truth to that. The Oregon capital's primary water source is supplied by the Bull Run Watershed. It's also the key ingredient in one of the city's most popular watering holes, Bull Run Distillery. The Bull Run Watershed is a very unique water source. It's protected by an act of Congress back in the 1870s, and the city's fathers got their hands on a beautiful lake up in the Cascade Mountains, and it's been that way since the 1870s. It used to flow through wooden pipes by gravity to Portland. It's that water that gives Bull Run Distillery's products its distinct character. Two bottles are being featured in Rackhouse Whiskey Club's next box. Rackhouse Whiskey Club, it's a Whiskey of the Month club, and they're on a mission to uncover the best flavors and stories that craft distilleries across the U.S. have to offer. Rackhouse ships out two of their featured distillery's finest bottles, along with some cool merchandise in a box delivered to your door every two months. Go to rackhousewhiskeyclub.com to check it out and try some Bull Run for yourself. Use code PURSUIT for $25 off your first box. 291 Colorado Whiskey aims to create a one of a kind, bold and beautiful Colorado whiskey. Rugged, refined, rebellious. Owner and founding distiller Michael Myers built the original still from copper photogravure plates, which he used to create enduring photographic scenes from Western landscapes to the Chrysler Building. On September 11th, 2011, 10 years after 9-11 changed his life and the lives of so many others, he pulled the first whiskey off that still, building a future in whiskey off his passion for photography. What defines 291 Colorado Whiskey is its spirit. Passion permeates every sip. Find a bottle near you at 291coloradowhiskey.com. Write it like you stole it, drink it like you own it. 
live fast, and drink responsibly. We'll, we'll kind of shift the gears a little. Let's talk about Sazerac. You know, I, I will say that the one thing I will I will stand behind Sazerac and what they do very well is that they are not pulling the strings of saying like, okay, well, um, we're going to pull something off the market or we're going to just say like, hey, we see what this stuff trades for. We're not dumb. We're going to go ahead and we're going to MSRP our products at XYZ value, right? Um, they, I believe that they are in it for the long game. Like yeah. they see this as not, this is just a quick market blip where it's going to be something that, you know, if you chase after the short money and the short dollar, then that's all you're going to wait. That's, that's all that's going to happen. Like you're not going to be able to sustain this for the next 10, 15 years. So you, you brought know, up a good point. Cause a lot of people, distilleries do look at the secondary market, even though they say they don't, but to, especially for limited releases, they really have kind of fell on the secondary market to price things. Well, I mean, it's, uh, it's know, gone up, 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 and up every single year. Yeah, I mean, whereas Sazerac's kind of, kind of stayed true to like. I mean, I, don't get me wrong. There's been, there's been gradual increases. I mean, uh, you take it back to 2010 days. You know, antique collection was probably sixty five dollars, whatever. But it, going up to a hundred, like that's not a, that's not a good, that's not a huge shift yeah, versus the, something the, the, like, like Park, Park, Parker's was fifty five, seventy five bucks, and now it's like. Three four hundred, depending on you know that twenty four year is like four hundred right. bucks or three hundred bucks retail. And then you take a, a birthday bourbon for example, back in two thousand three, that was a forty five dollar bottle. Uh, now it's one sixty one sixty out the door at the distillery. So I mean, yeah. it's it's that's definitely something. The way that the way that Sazerac operates is basically through the brain of Mark Brown. And Mark is a very uh, conservative you know, thinker when it comes to business and how they do things, but he's also a long-term planner. They have planned out their whiskey projections through 2043. So they are, they are that planned out Mm -hmm. and they have um, made the appropriate, um, you know, business decisions that, you know, to get them where they need to be. I think that the biggest concern that consumers have with the way that company operates is through distribution. Now, a lot of it is not anything that they can control. You go into a, a, a retailer or an on-premise facility, and they will tell you that the only way that they can get Pappy or Buffalo Trace Antique Collection is if they carry uh, Wheatley Vodka or some of the other Sazerac mm-hmm. brands in, in, in large quantities. Now, that is, that is a, a decision that is made at the distributor level is it? And not that's because I always I always kind of thought like somehow there's something working in the back the back room over here and there's greasy palms to be able to say like you know I think like, I, if you want this you got to start I think that is a very palm. good conspiracy theory to have but as of right now it is illegal you know to have those conversations for it is illegal for a um, a supplier to dictate who gets what that is an actual law that is under the uh, Federal Alcohol Administration Act. Now, what is happening? I don't know. But I do know that everybody wants that whiskey. And, you know, how, how, does, how does the distributor make the decision of who to give it to? Now, I've had conversations with people like uh, Joe Beatrice, who's like, the only way that you can do this is, you know, top, top level down, you know, customer loyalty. Mm-hmm. And so it's like, you know, how do they, how does a distributor make the decision of who gets the five bottles of Pappy? Is it a, is it a favoritism thing? Because if that's the case, that's also, you know, is that, is that fair? Uh, is it, um, do you give it to the one who's like doing your, doing your, your bulk purchases? I also, I've also heard of them like, um, like the distributors making decisions of like giving, you know, using Pappy to, to get rid of non Sazerac products. So like Beam would be in their portfolio or, you know, another big brand like that and say like, take up, take all this off of our hands and you get, you get a case of Pappy. So that stuff happens. And, and that is not, you know, to my knowledge, you know, I don't know how that, you know, how those conversations are going. But yeah, you, you don't know if that's necessarily Sazerac's yeah, fault I mean, or problem. I, it's on it, the distributor. It, it, it comes back to them. But do you think they uh, falsely manipulate their supply? Like, to this create this cr- theory, create right? this allocation like myth or because every time I go to Buffalo Trace, there's 
they're always bottling Blantons, and it's always piled up cases upon cases upon cases. Done, it's like what, what they have done, and they got as many warehouses as all yeah. these other big boys. Yeah, but you got to realize they're also filling and hand doing every single one with six people on a line. That's yeah. not that's not Heaven Hill level automation. Right? Yeah, what what yeah, they, but they got a lot of warehouses, a lot of aged juice in there. Mm-hmm. I mean, they, this is true. <laughs> Well, what they do, um, they do put out, they, they used to put out an annual press release uh, about that, and it got picked up everywhere. You know, it was smart marketing, I'll tell you that. But what, what Buffalo Trace has done is that they have spread the markets out so much. Like, so let's say, you know, they're trying to penetrate every market in the country. My best friend lives in uh, northern Wisconsin. He used to be able to get Buffalo Trace regularly. Now he can only get one bottle a month. Because, mm-hmm. you know, because now that northern allocation is, is moving on over to North Dakota. And so what they have done is they have, they're trying to saturate the domestic market so much that they've spread themselves out of being able to get into the hands of a lot of people. So, so that allocation, that supply is because they're trying to open up bars in uh, Montana. And places like Montana and Wyoming, North Dakota... You know, I dare say you walk into a random liquor store there and you, you might you might find like a gold mine of like Sazerac products. Mm-hmm. Well, or so are they if you're out or are they using their, you know, everyday products like Buffalo Trace or Weller, Weller 12 to kind of fuel the more premium products like BTAC and Pappy? Do you think they're, you know, I mean, most of the most of what they do is they come out with a, a, a lower version of everything. You got Stag Junior, you've got Eagle yeah. Rare, and then you got the big boys on top of that. I know, but it seems like there's more like 12 year. It's I think it's sometimes easier to get a Van Winkle 12 than it is a, a Weller 12 sometimes, you know. Well, I think that's this is also um, just the the rise and the rise of bourbon and the amount of people that are looking for it, too. I mean, that's we say it's it's hard. It's, it's not because, yes, I, I still think there's. I, I would honestly probably guess that there's probably they're pushing out more product now than they ever have, but it seems still scarce to us because there's still there's more people now that yeah. are looking for it. And it, let's I'll put on their hat for a second. They have everybody in the world wants them. How do you how do you decide um, what market gets what? Yeah, I mean it's that's it's definitely a, a tough call because you've got to you got to take one out of your 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 playbook here as as who's been with us for the longest time, who are the most loyal customers, um, who are the ones with the biggest pockets right now that are that really want us. I mean, mm-hmm. money talks. Like, let's not be. Bernie Lovers always said it the best. This is not the bourbon charity. This is the bourbon business. Yeah. And so who's got who's got money? Money's gonna talk. Um, and if if by some chance and, and Ryan, you know, we've looked at this when we were opening up distribution for pursuit series and we're like, Oh, what States should we go for? And he did a trip down to Texas and we're like, I always forget that you two like own a brand. <laughs> like we're having this conversation. <laughs> I'm like, wait, you guys hate your customers. <laughs> uh, no, you know? we, don't. we listen to our customer <laughs> feedback. And yeah, we, we listen and we go, we go to snail's pace, but I mean, <laughs> the, but the part was, you know, he said like, let's look at Texas and you look at Texas and, and he came back from a trip and he was like, Kenny, this is, this is so smart. Like why not? There's like, there are more people in the city of Dallas than there are in the state of Kentucky. There's three times as many people in the city of Dallas as there is in the whole state of Kentucky. And it's, and then you got states or cities like Houston, San Antonio, Austin, and you're yeah. like, why would, you know, and, any liquor company would be smart to... And they're thirsty. They're thirsty yeah. for it, right? And it's it's like, okay, well, that's, that's an easy target. So you go after... Uh, the larger markets that are going to have a lot of You got the Dallas Bourbon Club. Shout out to you boys. Yeah. Yep. I'm Ryan a member. Peach Mitt. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. And so, I mean, like, those are the, those are the kind of three ways that I look at it. Um, if I'm a, if I'm a you know, brand owner and I want to figure out if I've got an allocated whiskey, how do I get into the hands of the people? That's the, that's the way I'm going to go. Ryan, do you have any kind of other thoughts uh, on that one? I mean, just going back to what Fred said, like, they're trying to get into these new markets, and I think they're trying to position themselves – because they're they're all pumping out a ton of juice so when the product finally becomes of age they don't they have us as customers already so it's like we need to go promote it other places so when we do have the stock available 
we can spread it out everywhere. Not in, whereas if they just focused on us bourbon consumers, they're going to have a whiskey glut. Well, they want to find new consumers too. Yeah. Right? I mean, you, you, but that's what I mean. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. We can't keep selling it to the same three guys here that have more bottles and they can drink for the rest of their life. Right. They want to find yeah. the new customers and that's, yeah. that's really how the, yeah, the brand that, is going to that, grow. That, it, that's what it comes down to. And you know what? I, I saw that in the magazine business, you know, like, um, one of the big reasons why I decided to go out on my own uh, for with the magazine is because the magazines I was writing for were pursuing new audiences that would require me to be writing about cocktails and you know and not the stories that I wanted to tell. And so anytime you anytime you um, ESPN did this too. ESPN is and and so did um, VH1 and MTV. Anytime you watered down like what was the essence of what you yeah. were trying to do and you're trying to reach a new audience, you're always going to like appear like you don't care about your original customer. That's just how it is. Mm-hmm. You grow. Well, you, you, you kind of lose to, it. Well, to make it appeal to the mass market, you always have to like dumb it down to where like, cause it, it, you have to make it appeal to everyone versus like a very f- small niche. And so that small niche that you appeal to at first you kind of have to break away from them because the everyday consumer is not going to be as passionate as that very small niche is. Yeah. You're early, mm-hmm. early adopters. Yeah, and, but, the, you know, pe- they got to pivot too, right? And if you just think of MTV, like, I can't remember the last time I watched a music video on TV, but if I watch a music video, it's usually on YouTube, right? There's a new platform that takes over and, and takes care of that, but YouTube's a multi-dimensional platform for all that kind of stuff. But, you know, I kind of want to talk Including about... Including Bourbon Pursuit. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. We and, will never dumb down our content. <laughs> <laughs> and Minic Media, while we keep doing the shout-outs here. Yeah. So um, let's let's talk about two more brands while we uh, kind of wrap this up a little bit. You know, there's, there's one brand that comes to mind. You know, we talked about Old Forester Birthday Bourbon. But Brown Foreman, I think they do an incredible job of really not pissing off the consumer base. You know, they've got products that are continually coming out at aggressive price points. Um, and, and really, they've only got, it, should I say, besides Old Forts of Birthday Bourbon, and now you got King of Kentucky, they don't have a whole lot of stuff that is the super premium, highly allocated stuff. And so they are continually trying to just make everyday solid products. Yeah, I mean, the, the Old Forester extension is like great everyday, like, drinker i mean the bald and bond the 86 i mean those are like i could drink those the rye yes that they just came out wow but i mean like these prohibition series i mean like the 1910 like and 1920 just always consistently blow my socks every time i drink i'm like this is really good at 50 to 60 bucks and one thing one thing that um chris morris did with the prohibition series is when they when they or, or no when they did the wheat whiskey release with woodford you know, they, uh, it wasn't the Prohibition series, it was with Woodford. They sent the release out and said, we have now uh, released every single type of whiskey that was allotted in the 1935 Federal Alcohol Administration Act. And I was just like, oh my God, that's so cool. <laughs> and I'm like, there's probably not another person in the world who gave <laughs> that two would shits about that. But I was like, I was like, the fact that, you know, in their release, they're dropping like one of the greatest like legal documents I've ever read. And I was like, so I was like a can- kid in the candy store with that press release. Mm-hmm. I didn't publish it, but I was, you know, it was very well done. And yeah. that, the thing about Brown Foreman is that they overly think, you know. So while they while they are doing a lot of this stuff, I also think they've been kind of left behind in a lot of these uh, conversations of like, you know, you just mentioned you don't have a lot of allocated stuff, you know. So in like, if you are, if if you're if you're thinking about it, like. Is that not a good thing? I mean, because now, you know, um, Heaven Hill's got a hi- lot of highly allocated stuff. Four Roses is highly alloc- lot of al- highly allocated stuff, and so does um, Buffalo Trace. And I don't see why, you know, Brown Foreman doesn't because their whiskey out of the barrel is incredible. Mm-hmm. Well, you think it's because they promoted like Woodford so hard out the gate versus and kind of left Old Foe just to wither, and then now it's kind of regain popularity i think old foresters coming back hard yeah i i, and, I look and birthday at, bourbon is highly allocated by the way it so very is it very that. much is but i look at at what the resurgence of old forester as the same resurgence we see with 1792 right like 
how many people were really like gung ho talking about 1792 and still they started coming off with all these extensions of their bottled and bond, yeah. foolproof, mm -hmm. sweet wheat, um, high rye. I mean, By the, the way, it's finish. a very interesting comparison because they have, they both have a very unique note in there that I detect in both of them. So mm -hmm. bananas. But, yeah. Banana note. <laughs> mm -hmm. Uh, and you, you have to also remember that the beast of uh, Brown Foreman is the world's number one whiskey in Jack Daniels. And uh, I, I tell you what, some of the barrel proof stuff coming out of Jack Daniels right now. It's fantastic. It's some of the best whiskey uh, you can find. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think what they, what Brown Foreman does really, really well is that 30 to $50 uh, product. Mm -hmm. They do a great job with that. And I know a lot of people don't, are, are not Woodford fans, but that's a lot of people's favorite bourbon. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've been, uh, I've been on airplanes where I've seen, uh, ladies yell at someone sitting next to them for pouring Coke with Woodford. Like, how dare you pour Coke with the world's <laughs> best bourbon? So, yeah, somebody that's from the a, Louisville airport. Too. A lot of bourbon consumers that aren't whiskey geeks, like Woodford, is their like yeah. premium go-to. You know, it's like I'm always amazed, not amazed, because it is great juice, but it's like you forget that that it is like yeah the common marketplace. That's their like premium go-to. All right, so one last gripe before we kind of close this out, and that's one thing that I talked about at the top of the show, and that's uh, the allocations of barrel picks that used to go to bourbon societies and used to go to people. Charities. Charities, yeah. toddies, everybody that was doing them early on, and now it's like, eh, sorry, you're not selling enough. And this is we're seeing this at Four Roses, and we're seeing this at Wild Turkey. Um, and so kind of talk about really what is the effect of kind of, from a, if you're the manufacturer uh, or if you're the, the end consumer, like, do you hate the brand more now? Like, do you, are you starting to look at other places? I mean, cause we're, we're good friends with Reed and Emerald from 1789B. Um, you know, they, they said that their allocations are gone from uh, wild Turkey and other places like that, where they used to go and just go in and do barrel picks all the time. And now they're looking at other places. They're looking at wilderness trail. They're looking at, yeah, uh, it's just, it's opened up an opportunity for these like new players in the game to like kind of like we've gone to barrel picks at, at many places but like you're not you're treated more like royalty when you go to like new riff or wilderness trails or willets or somewhere whereas other ones are like how can we get them in and out of here as fast as possible well it's like, clockwork to them <laughs> yeah it's like we're gonna roll out three barrels and you have 15 minutes to taste each and then we're gonna go through this and this and get out now so, well, I mean, I still enjoy a no, Four no. Roses experience and stuff like that. I still enjoy the experiences. I mean, when you go to Wild Turkey, you're there with Eddie, and and you know, you know, it's not Eddie making these decisions, right? Um, you know, this this is definitely higher up in the but food I also, chain. I also think that Eddie would make those decisions if he had to. You know, that's something we have to always remember that they're kind of protected. Like that, we we always want to give like the distillers a break, but they are. You know, they have people there kind of around them to protect them and make them continue to look like the good guy. But don't think for a second that they're not in those rooms having conversations and saying like... And giving their input. Yeah, yeah. We're, we're about to lose our stock, of, you know, for 2025 if we keep doing these barrel picks. So they're looking out for the long term and healthiness of their brands. And, that, and that's what they it comes down to. They play good cop when they're around us. And then that's the exactly right. <laughs> I, I do not be fooled by that, um, the, the niceties from the distillers. Believe mm -hmm. me, like someone like Bo Beckman at Sazerac, everybody hates that guy because he's the keeper of the barrels. Mm -hmm. But he's he's going off of what someone else tells him, you know, and um, he's got the allocation. Yeah, and I'm sure if they if they had unlimited barrel supply, they'd love to keep doing it, right? I mean, I think I think that's one thing that people don't understand about. Actually, I don't know if they would. They probably like, well, they, it's well, like the, thing the is, most like, inefficient me, process, and it's a low margin. Are thing. you yeah. feeling personally? Are you feeling cut off? No, I don't think I'm feeling personally cut off. I think it's, so, well, it's, it's, let's it's, analyze. Harder, well, it's harder than us. It's harder for us to get it. So because you mentioned 1789B. Let's mention, I, uh, I'm a part of a charity that got cut off. Uh, what, what's, a, what's another group that you know of that got cut off? I know of uh, two retailers that got cut out of uh, a wild turkey. Mm-hmm. Well, well, I mean, yeah, yeah, I mean, there's, there's, it's, it's all around, right? Yeah. I mean, it's, there's definitely, it's, so we it's don't, across the board. We don't see a, um, you know, a commonality other than that they're small. This place isn't getting cut off. Uh, MGM in Las Vegas isn't getting cut off. And Total Wine, look at they're not getting cut off. So it, it, it goes back to this, this conversation of like, who's spending the most money. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I think it's short-sighted to cut out 1789 
and you know people like that that have um, in- incredible connections within the bourbon world. And we're the one of the pioneers of actually yeah. doing some of this stuff. Yeah, too. I don't. I don't think yeah, you should they, ever they, cut out some of these like that. groups and a lot of money to charities. Like a lot of good comes out of these. Barrel but there's picks. also been some charities that have been debunked, right? You know, so you got to remember that too. True. Just like we've seen with the counterfeit, there are always fuckwads that are going to take advantage of the uh, <laughs> of the scenario and the situation. Fuck so wads. I like that. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> so I think we're going to go ahead and wrap that one up because you know we've we we put some people under fire here. We. I'll make sure everybody knows that if you're a brand and you're listening to this, we still love every single oh, one yeah. of you. We still love the product you're putting out. We wouldn't talk about you if we didn't care. So exactly. Come on the show. Look- and join us. Yeah. yeah. We're yeah. looking out for you. We want what's best for you. Actually, yeah. they're not looking out for you. They're not. Well, I mean, they're, they, they're co- totally we're looking out for, for us, now, <laughs> now they got a brand. They're trying to knock you down so their brand goes up. You don't have to worry about <laughs> us. Our, our 24 I'm barrels kidding. a year, I think. Uh, yeah, it's like we don't, we're not going to, we're not going to be stepping on any toes anytime soon. That's for sure. Yeah. <laughs> no, you, well, you know what I would, you know, I'll talk to you about this off the air. I'll, I'll bring this up. Sorry. That's okay. So, you know, it, like I said, just make sure that you do have a uh, pretty thick skin if you're listening to this from brand, because we do, we love you. We love having uh, all the personalities and people behind the brands on the show, you know, we just kind of look at this from, you know, we, we, we see what happens in the the Facebook groups and Reddit and everything like that when people are writing blog posts of, of saying like, oh, we, we don't like you anymore. So we're just trying to look at this from the consumer perspective. Don't and, shoot the messenger. Yeah, exactly. Uh, like I, will, I will say, though, that um, I've said this for more than a decade. Don't forget the customers who brought you to the dance. Mm-hmm. That's it. Absolutely. So thank you everybody for listening. We hope you enjoyed this episode. We recorded at Hotel Distill. Hotel is Distill is located in downtown Louisville here on Whiskey Row. And for those who thirst new experiences, you should come check it out. It's a home for the connoisseurs of the finest comforts and gracious service. It's a space where you're going to pass through historic Whiskey Row facade to enjoy a true and authentic Louisville destination. You can book your experience for it yourself at hoteldistill.com. And it's set to open here on November 1st of 2019. So, fellas, thank you once again for joining on the show. Yeah. And we'll Glad see you to all. have everybody back. Yep. Yeah. Next week. Rock and roll. Rock and roll.